please give a warm welcome to Billy D. Williams and Jill Hopkins. Guys, it's Billy T. Williams. <laughs> so as Tracy said, my name is Jill Hopkins, and I have never answered an email quicker than when they asked me if I wanted to do this with you, Mr. Williams. So thank you for uh, making that an especially exciting Uber ride. Uh, my driver was almost ex as excited as I am. Speaking of which... Uh, thank you for making it very exciting. <laughs> Speaking of which, every single person I've talked to about this, young, old, black, white, anywhere in between, has been so excited to know that you were going to be in Chicago, so excited to know that they were going to have a chance to do this. You've had such a wide-ranging career with such great characters that have elicited such a wide range of emotion from people. How does it feel to know that every person in, in any room you probably walk into has a different Billy D that they love? Well, it's, it's obviously is it's, uh, quite pleasing, yeah. you know. <laughs> it's nice to be appreciated. I, I think we can all agree to that <laughs> as just as human beings, just as, uh, you know, uh, molecules on this little tiny planet in the middle of somewhere and nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to be appreciated. Well, uh, Chicago appreciates more than I think a lot of places do. We're a very friendly town. And this is not the first time I've been in a room in Chicago where people have been appreciating Billy D. Williams. Picture it, and I'm telling this story like Sophia from Golden Girls. <laughs> 2011, it's President's Day, Harpo Studios, the Oprah Winfrey Show. My mother and I were sitting in the audience, and Diana Ross was the special guest. And Oprah had a trick up her very expensive sleeve where she surprised Diana with Billy D. Williams. <laughs> and my mother and I were sitting on the, the aisle there where the tunnel is, where the guests come out, and you came out, and you only had eyes for Diana, but for like a split second, I think you looked at us. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, but it was like, <laughs> it was a th we had a thing going on. But it honestly felt like Beatlemania in the room at the time. Do you remember that day? Yeah, I think I, yeah, I, I should, yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, it was a very interesting day. Uh, I mean, it, uh, Diana was clearly very surprised, and if I remember correctly. She was being interviewed. She was being interviewed, yes. and they asked her, like, in the And all of her children were there. Yep, there was Tracy, yeah. and. Uh, By the way, Tracy, what an, uh, an extraordinarily talented human being. Right? I mean, it does not skip a generation in that family. That is, that is a very talented family. But they were talking to Diana about Lady Sings the Blues and about Mahogany and about you and your time together. And next thing you know, ladies and gentlemen, Billy Dee Williams! And the smile on her face and the smile on your face was very special. Can you tell me about the relation, the, the working, but also the professional relationship you had with her? We had a good time, uh, uh, you know. Uh, at the when I was hired to play Louis McKay, um, <laughs> I, uh, I, 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 uh, Barry was uh, he was auditioning me that day that that I auditioned. I, I didn't have my glasses, so I had a difficulty reading the script. <laughs> so. Uh, but she came into the room, and uh, it was like an, uh, an immediate kind of uh, chemistry between the two of us. We, I always felt like 
I don't know what she thinks about it, how she looks at it, but I always felt like I was like meeting my schoolmate. Uh, I felt like we were like two little kids who really just enjoyed each other, not really knowing each other, but really just responded to each other like two little children who walk into a classroom and they meet each other for the first time and they know that they're going to have a lot of fun. Ooh, a partner in crime. <laughs> I love that. I mean, it, it was obvious on the screen that there but was... When I, when I did the, the uh, screen test, yeah. I was terrible. I was the worst. And, uh, but again, when the two of us got in front of that camera, uh, Barry knew right away, and he has a nose for that kind of stuff. You're telling me Barry Gordy has an eye for talent. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds made up. <laughs> yeah. Well, he saw it. He immediately saw it. In fact, after I got through uh, doing the, sc the screen test, uh, he, he ran up to me uh, with his inimitable and whimsical personality. He says, Yo, you're Lewis McKay. Don't worry. I got it. You know, he was talking about his team. They call a team these days, uh, all of the people that work for him. Yeah. He said, I just got to talk to these people because they had Paul Winfield in mind for that character. Oh. Hmm. Who's a, you know, a great actor. Yeah. He's no Billy Dee. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to agree with you. On that one. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, Barry ran up to me. He says, you're Louis McKay. No, don't worry, you're going to be Louis McKay. So that was how it all... Uh, what was that? Sorry, that was my lip gloss. I want it to be ready for anything. Oh. <laughs> is that yours? What That's is mine, that? sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I'll put that back. I'll put that back. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's, that's how it kind of all started. Well, let's talk about how it all started, started. All the way back in Harlem, when Harlem was Harlem, and not just an extension of, you know, a gentrified New York. Your description of your neighborhood in your book was so vivid and made me nostalgic for a time that I didn't live in. But what do you miss the most about the Harlem of your youth that doesn't exist in Harlem anymore? Well, I was up there just uh, a few, a couple, uh, last week for the first time in a long time. Is the building you grew up in still there? Is the building you grew up in still there? Yeah, the, I, but we drove through it. It was uh, getting dark, so I couldn't really see what was going on. It looked a little bit different than uh, from when I remember it. But uh, I had to go there to the uh, Schomburg for, for this mm -hmm. event. But also, I donated one, one of my paintings to the Schomburg many, many years ago. Fantastic. So, and it's, it's called 110th Street. It's all about my experience on 110th Street with my father and uh, certain situations. Uh, but, it's, but I saw the painting for the first time in years, and I just realized, my God, what a good painter this <laughs> What a good painter I am. Um, I'm but but <laughs> Harlem Harlem the th the kind of things that I remember about Harlem I don't know if although when I drove through uh, Harlem I I thought it was going to be a lot less interesting and attractive there's an awful lot of small business things going on in in Harlem right now. I thought it was going to be like, uh, I don't know if it's not a good thing to say, but say it. I thought it was going to be like a banana republic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm but not sure that there's not. You maybe just did a <laughs> drive past No, it. when I was a kid, you know, before the uh, militants took over, uh, it was like uh, flourishing with businesses. Um, uh, 125th Street, my mother worked on 125th Street. Uh, at Bush Jewelry Store, and I remember when I was 13 years old, I wanted to have a job 
for the summer, and I got a job working for Bush Jewelry Store as a bonded messenger where I carried jewelry in a su little suitcase uh, from borough to borough. That's how I learned a lot about boroughs. And about personal safety, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I could do that kind of stuff today. <laughs> There's no way. Uh, but it, it uh, and then, you know, uh, there was the growing up with my girlfriend, Sandra Day, and uh, uh, whose father was a, a principal of a, a junior high school, and her, her, uh, her brother went to Dartmouth. Uh, the, I grew up a lot with the uh, black bourgeoisie, uh, you know, the Jack and the Jill. Jack and Jill's, yes. <laughs> I don't think I was named after that Jill, but I did appreciate your explanation of Jack and Jill in, in the book, because I don't think a lot of people know what that whole thing was about. Do you mind explaining a little bit about? Well, it was pretty amusing for me. <laughs> uh, my, my sister was much more involved in all of that. Uh, I, I was a bit of a rebel when I was a kid. That's right. So, you know, and I was, my favorite actors were like Marlon Brando, you know, there was a, the, the, the whole period of uh, what they call Stanislavski method. It was, uh, uh, I was attracted to a, a kind of a rebellious way of doing things as opposed to be, being uh, organized. Um, so whenever I went to parties, everybody dressed up and so forth. Even though I went to cotillions, I, used to, I took Sandra Day to a cotillion. Uh, but um, when everybody would be dressed up in, in their best refinery, I was always walking in with a, a tattered jacket with little holes in it. <laughs> I mean, I thought that was that was my modus <laughs> operandi, so to speak. There's but Harlem was a well, you had Minton's, it's one of the great jazz joints up there mm -hmm. on 118th Street. Uh, my, um, I lived on 110th Street, which was between Lenox and Fifth. It was like the hub for the Fifth Avenue bus. But on that street that I lived, we had uh, Nina Mae McKinney, who was like the first black woman to become a movie star, who ended up dying. Uh, from uh, uh, heroin. Mm. She was a heroin addict. Um, we had uh, Hugh and Jack, who was the first, uh, 35 West 110th Street, or was it 45? Uh, was the first black um, uh, Manhattan borough president. Uh, th that was an interesting whole situation with him. And then there, uh, we had uh, Dr. Channing uh, Tobias, who was the head of the uh, NAACP, uh, and uh, I knew his uh, his grandson. His grandson was a beautiful boy, sort of a James Dean kind of character. But when he, his mother, his father broke up with his mother, he ended up committing suicide. He he jumped off the uh, George Washington Bridge oh, onto the jetty. Uh, a wonderful kid, but a wild, wild kid. Uh, that sounds like a wild time and a wild place. But also, like, we also had some of the greatest, most beautiful call girls. <laughs> oh, they were gorgeous, <laughs> legendary gorgeous. <laughs> Har Harlem contains multitudes, doesn't it? <laughs> For every one NAACP president, you get five of the hottest hookers you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> I, I, loved, I loved reading about, first of all, I read a lot of celebrity memoirs, and it's kind of refreshing to read one where the author likes their family. That, that like, you all got along for the most part. Yeah, mommy and daddy and grandmommy and my, my twin sister, lady. She was eight minutes older than me. Almost killed my mother, the two of us coming out of my mom. Uh, she pushed me out of the way. And 
And that's when I realized how docile I am. <laughs> you know. And I took I I always characterize it as, as being stupid. <laughs> no, well, no, I say it's a pretty smart move when you live in a multi-generational household that has more women than men in it to sometimes just get out of the way. Just shut up sometimes. That's a lesson you learn very early. And I know because it happened to me. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, no, no, but, you know, I used to feel sorry for my father I mean, because th between my mother and my mommy and uh, grandmommy and my sister, they spoil the hell out of me. Um, <laughs> he would always try to make me tough, but they were always sort of coddling me. Uh, but it was a wonderful experience with all of those people. My grandmother, we used, she was from the British West Indies. Who, she never became an American citizen. She was uh, didn't she didn't like uh, she was a Britisher to the uh, end. She used to sit around the house singing, "Rule Britannia, rule Britannia, rule the waves. Britain never, never shall be slaves." I used to sit there and go, like, "What? I don't understand why." <laughs> But anyway, she was, uh, we used to call her the Queen Dowager. Uh, she, <laughs> she, was, uh, she was quite a character. Hannette Nellie Botkin. She married uh, Patrick Botkin, who he worked on the, that's my grandfather, uh, her husband, worked on the Panama Canal uh, in those years. And he was a shoemaker by trade and made shoes for Wanamakers. I don't know if you folks ever heard of Wanamakers, but it was a famous shoe company back in those years. But uh, anyway, she, she never became a citizen. He became a citizen. Uh, and he also, with the Cubans, he started the, uh, the numbers game, oh. you know, poor people's game at that time. But uh, she, she uh, never liked uh, Americans, black and white. She didn't like <laughs> One of my favorite things about your grandma. My grandmother was the most prejudiced woman I have ever met in my life. An equal opportunity hater. <laughs> <laughs> she was something else. I like how you described how she would always just go in on your dad. He never had a moment to Well, face. you know, first of all, he was very light-skinned. <laughs> and uh, Patty Botkin, her husband, was dark-skinned. So she would say, Patty Botkin, he was beautiful. He was like black velvet. <laughs> and she would look at my father and say, I would never look at anybody like you. <laughs> In the man's <laughs> own house. <laughs> <laughs> she was wonderful, my grandmother. <laughs> she was wonderful. But they were all, you know, and think about it. In those days, you know, living in an apartment complex, one bathroom for all of the people in that household, all of us, one bathroom, and we all worked it out. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you have to. What other yeah. choice do you have? But it was situations? wonderful. Yeah. It was wonderful. You get to know a lot about yourself and your own boundaries <laughs> when you live. I remember, that. you know, when I did A Taste of Honey on Broadway with uh, Angela Lansbury and Joni Plowright, uh, we were out, we started in California, and I was like the first time I had ever, the second time I had ever left uh, New York City. And we started in uh, California, in Los Angeles, and worked our way back to, to uh, uh, New York, to the New York stage. But I remember Angela invited us all to her home in L.A., out in Malibu. And I'm this kid, you know, I don't know about, you know, how folks out there live. <laughs> So she's showing us around the house, and she says, th th this is my room, and this is my husband's room. A and I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I asked her, I said, how come you have your own room and your husband has his own room? And it was the first time I had ever heard the expression, having your own space. <laughs> and that's exactly how I live my life today. <laughs> I really am a great believer in having your own place to go. <laughs> <laughs> we got some believers out there. <laughs>
it, I mean, it keeps you a little bit sane. You have your, your, your stuff, your partner or whoever has their stuff. When you want to come together, it's a special occasion and you can treat it as such. You've had some great, um, let's say romantic roommates in your, in your life. Did you always prioritize having your own space even when you were married? Even you just go visit, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ding dong, Avon College. Very simple. It's not difficult. <laughs> I want to talk to and you. Sometimes it's better. Sometimes. I mean, it feels like a sleepover, slumber party. Yeah. <laughs> in your book, there's a there's a line in chapter three where you state very simply, "Girls changed everything." And in this part of the book, you're at the age where most people who are attracted to girls start noticing them. But, and tell me if I'm wrong, Billy Dee Williams, it seems as though that attitude has gone through with you to, for the rest of your life. You have a very distinct effect on women, and I don't think I'm the first person to tell you that. <laughs> I think women are one of them. You women are wonderful. You're crazy. But <laughs> But <laughs> you're, you're absolutely wonderful, <laughs> you know? and I've spent a lot of time around <laughs> you, you ladies. <laughs> and for that, we thank you. I mean, <laughs> you've told not a lie. If it's uh, if it's not too plain a question, I think the people would want to know, Billy D. Williams, what is your secret? What's your secret with the lady? And can you help some of these men because they need it? <laughs> uh, I think I'm the biggest asshole idiot in the world. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I can't teach anybody anything. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I, I've devoted my, I, I, I hadn't thought about it that way. I guess I have devoted my whole life uh, to sort of exploring. <laughs> and, you know, I remember when I read this book when I was a kid, um, Catherine Narai, uh, J.D. Salinger, mm -hmm. and it was all about this, this kid who was just running around having a good time just learning about this, learning about that, without malice you know, of, of four, four, four. Is that the right proper? I think so. Malice of four, 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 four. Is that proper? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, I'm, I've always been this kind of a, kind of an innocent, kind of a, I mean, after a while, it, it's no longer innocence. But <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say but, anything, but. <laughs> but with a sense of naivete, mm. you know, I've always, and even today, I think that even at my age, I, I Still think that I'm very naive about things. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, really seri seriously. No, no, think about it. I mean, there's a difference between his innocence and, and being naive. I, I mean, I, I think naive, naivete is, I don't know, okay. No, um, I wanna hear where this goes. I mean, you, it, there's something to be said for just like, Going through life, letting life kind of knock you around for a while, and the naivete says, well, we're not going to do that again. Well, you know, with me, it's always been like, every time I wanted to go to the right, something in me said, no, 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 Billy, go to the left. <laughs> you know, and I, and I just trusted it and, 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 and did that because I never really, my sister said it to me. You know, I said to my sister one time, she was a straight-A stu student. And uh, from the time she went to school until, like, when she finished and went to college, uh, straight-A. And I, used to, I said to her one day, I said, you know, you're so smart, not so stupid. <laughs> and she said, no, 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 boo. No, 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 no. You just have your head in the clouds. And I think, basically, that's... I am this person who has my head <laughs> in the cloud. That makes you an artist. 
maybe that I guess that's true. Yes. You know, I'm never looking to hurt anybody. I mean, it's, you know, I'm not, I don't care about hurting anybody. It doesn't, I'm not intrigued with hurting anybody. <laughs> I mean, like a lot of people are. Yeah, we're, it's, it's, it's one of the biggest problems we have. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you've got your head in the clouds, that makes a really good segue to talking about Star Wars. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, Lando Calrissian, obviously one of the, the great sci-fi characters, one of the most charismatic sci-fi characters in a, across any sort of series. I told you, Chicago, Chicago. So the title of the book is What Have We Here? And it's definitely uh, such an iconic line. It's the first line you say to uh, Leia. But it's not just that you said it, Billy Dee Williams. It's how you said it. <laughs> say it right now. Say it. <laughs> Hello, what have we here? <laughs> if you want to kiss my hand, you can. <sighs> it, it, okay. It, it, oh, it, okay. It works every time. <laughs> I know, I knew going sleeveless was the right call. I am, I am warm. But, so you come on the scene, we're already like a movie and a quarter into the Star Wars saga by the time we meet Lando. So we're in it, like, as an audience, we are like dedicated to these characters. And now here comes this swab motherfucker who lives <laughs> in the sky. And it just worked. It just worked. Was it the was it the hair? Was it the cape? Was it the inherent Billy D. Williamsness of it? What do you think made people just fall in love with Lando? Scene one, line one. You know, it's interesting. You know, when I when I was presented, when I was offered to play Lando, uh, when I heard the name Calrissian, first of all, I thought, well, that's an Armenian name. I said, let me see what I can do with that. That's interesting. <laughs> and uh, then I got the cape, and I thought, well, this, this is Errol Flynn time. <laughs> so Now you're swashbuckling. Yeah, yeah, this is swashbuckling time. And I decided I wanted to, rather than go with uh, something stereotypical, uh, because, you know, uh, uh, George Lucas, you know, he got a lot of flack about, uh, Darth Vader being this big um, black ominous figure and really what he was trying to do in that whole situation was um, it was like the uh, the old syndrome, the cowboy syndrome the guy in the white hat the good guy in the white hat and the good black and the uh, bad guy in the black hat and you know people got, got used to that that point of view that perspective which, by the way, I never, I, I'm not like a lot of people who get upset about these things. I mean, I re realize that this is a, a kind of thinking that's a generational, and it's been going on for a long time. Yeah. And uh, I, I for one, find it more, uh, I, I, less upsetting and more humorous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, but. I decided, you know, I'm gonna no. Let, let me. I'm gonna. If I'm gonna do Lando, let me do Lando, uh, where he's not defined in any one particular way. That he's a sort of he's a bigger than life character. Uh, he he goes far beyond the question of uh, of ethnicity. You know, I I just feel I it, all of my characters actually that I've done, I don't rely on ethnicity. I see myself as a full spectrum of colors. I mean, and I'm a painter, so I understand that very well. Yeah. 
you know, t it, to me, it's all, mo most of who, what we are and what we do is based on nuance, on the subtleties. Yeah. I mean, it's, first of all, uh, it makes, well, most of all, for me, it makes it, the experience a, a lot more interesting. Mm. Rather than uh, getting stuck into one thing or the other. I mean, to, to uh, what I'm trying to say is. Um, yeah, like nuance and subtlety is not something that most people seem to have a grasp on anymore. Uh, it feels very. Well, I don't want to spend my life being pissed off. Listen. You know, and you, you know, you can, you can do, take all of your energy and, and just be pissed off. And I'm not going to, I just don't want to do that. Yeah. Life's too short. I never wanted to do that. I just figured if there's a negative, let me see the right? I'll work my way around it or I'll work through it, but I will find some new and innovative way to present the perspective or a point of view so that it allows you as a spectator to go like, wait a minute, wait a minute, what? that's interesting. Hmm. You know, maybe that's, maybe that, that. A and if I can manage to do that, I'd rather do it that way. I'd rather do it that way. Yeah. Rather than taking out banners and running around and yelling at people and stuff like that. Qui I'm not quiet saying, crusade. I'm not saying that's wrong. Yeah. I mean, it's right for people who want to do that. It's just not for you. But it's not for me, no. I hear you. I think that perspective is a great one to have when you are an actor and you have to inhabit a different character with every job. I'm a creative entity. I mean, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, please, please do. <laughs> no, go, please. It's all about creativity for me. Yeah. And the fun, the fun, the enjoyment of, of coming up with ideas that... Uh, I'm I'm a uh, an individualist. I'm from that school, and uh, I'm a futurist. I even took classes in futurism for a period of time with a guy by the name of F. M. S. Van Dierik from uh, Iran uh, many years ago at New School in New York. Um, but I I'm about the future. I mean, and the future. In order to get to the future. You have to embrace, in my opinion, this whole co concept of energy, the concept of vibrations, the concept of, of uh, frequency. No, it's the, I've had a very similar conversation uh, about this with Carlos Santana. He's a big energy guy. He's a big, uh, you know, what you put out into the universe is what you'll get back. You're a molecule. I'm a molecule. You know, wh everything that's out there is sitting right here. Yeah. All of you. We're, we're the universe. This is the whole friggin' universe sitting <laughs> out here. It's, it's wild to think about being everything, but also being nothing at the same time. And like being a centrifugal entity yeah and then being less than that but it's working all at the same time what is that wonderful word that i kind of discovered lately obfuscate oh teach teach us professor williams <laughs> i mean it's like living well i'm not going to say his name because i don't want people going to beat me up and certain <laughs> people will beat me up <laughs> But I mean, there are people who, who I mean, there's a, there's a, you're, we're living negatives and positives all at the same time. At least I, I don't, I'm not speaking for anybody else. Yeah, no, I get it. And as a, as a performer, as an artist, as a painter, you. I'm not saying anything unique. I'm not just. I don't know. Man, I, I think we read a lot of a very, uh, uh, you know, black and white opinions in our online lives every day, and they tend to drown out the real life 
experiences of other people. And I think that's a problem that we have. So you saying things like this, I think is very unique to hear because we hear so much, I don't know, not to oversimplify it, but like my way or the highway type things. When you seem to have a much gentler approach to how you see the world. Yeah, I do actually. <laughs> oh, yes, I do actually. <laughs> No, no, I'm not. I'm. I. I don't. Yeah, I guess I really don't want to spend a lot of time on bickering and arguing about stuff, because it's everything is just so. There's so much to figure out, so yeah. much to try to figure out. Yeah, and the good things that people do, and the good things that people are, are so much more interesting to talk about than the bad things that people do and the bad things that people are. And uh, if we do have the opportunity to concentrate on those things, I think we should take the, the opportunity to concentrate on those things, I think. Yeah. You've just changed some hearts and minds. You have changed the perspective of a room full of grown-ups, I think. With that. You know, uh, I used to spend a lot of time talking to one of the great jazz musicians, Clark Terry, who was a great jazz trumpeter. And uh, yeah, he was one of the greats. And I used to love to sit and because I used to bo I used to work for the Thelonious Monk Jazz Institute in uh, in D.C. Uh, for like over 22 years. I used to do their cover, their covers, uh, programs. Um, but I remember uh, we were talking one day, and uh, he was telling me about uh, Lester Young, oh. pork pie hat, mm -hmm. and we were talking about the bebop days and the bebop language. And uh, and I use it. I end the book with this one word. You know, like if somebody, if, if you ask somebody, uh, how was your day? Or they would ask you, how was your day? Instead of going through a long tri diatribe, instead of going through a, a, a long explanation, chandelier. That's poetry. I end the book with that. <laughs> Chandelier, Chandelier, baby. Chandelier. Mm. <laughs> mm. Chandelier. Some words just sound fancy. Huh? Some words just sound fancy. I don't know why chandelier sounds so fancy. Well, that's it. Chandelier <laughs> is like when you see a chandelier, you go, you know, it just makes you take a pause. Ooh. There's glass hanging from the ceiling. <laughs> There's nothing. And you, when you look at a chandelier, what is there to say? <laughs> you, when you're right, you're right. <laughs> chandelier, chandelier, baby. <laughs> See, this is why I could only listen to half the audiobook, because you read the audiobook like you are just you. Like, I'm listening to you, like, describe your life, but you're, did your producer just be like, you don't have to seduce everybody? <laughs> because... <laughs> you know, I watched Ellington. I always thought I could, I'm the only one to play Ellington, because I understand that sensibility. But I, the first time I met, I was 18 years old. And I had a, my dearest friend, uh, Al Duckett, who was the managing editor for uh, the New York Age, a black newspaper on 35th Street in, the, in, in Harlem. And he had a reception, f a reception for uh, Ellington. And all of these ladies were like, waiting for Ellington to come to, into the room. He made each woman feel like she was the only woman in that room. That's a superpower. I took out my pen and pencil, <laughs> my pad. <laughs> Let me chop that down. I said, okay. <laughs> but you know, he used to compete with his father to see who was most charming. You had a charm off with Duke Ellington's father? Yeah, he was, <laughs> they would compete with each other. But I understand that sensibility. You know, it's old fashioned. 
but it's lasting. It definitely is. And let me tell you, I am glad I'm not in the game anymore because the, uh, the players playing out here don't seem to know the fundamentals. They don't know dribbling. They don't know shooting. They're over here showboating, and it is not working out for them. I read that you don't rewatch the Star Wars films and that you did not watch Harrison Ford's latest Indiana Jones movie. And you said in this article, he's an old man. I don't want to watch an old guy running around <laughs> doing what he was doing when he was a younger man. First of all, that's hilarious. Second of all, this last Indiana Jones movie was pretty good. But third of all, there's, a, there's lots of people, lots of people in this room, lots of people in the world who would gladly lay down cash to see you running around doing what you did as a younger man. Maybe not the football and the, the running and the, the spaceships, but a rom-com or just like, uh, uh, you know, the Golden Bachelor is very hot right now. <laughs> we, would, uh, we would love to see you being the lover man that you are on screen again. Does that ever cross your mind? <laughs> no, no, no. I don't need to do that anymore. <sighs> I mean, I never needed to do it, to tell you the truth. Well, no. I, th I, think, I think you did. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, but... It was all a source of amusement for me. I mean, it was just fun. I, I don't take myself seriously. I take my work seriously, mm -hmm. but I don't take myself seriously. I think I'm the most comical person. Listen, I remember one time, I'll never forget, after I did Lady Sings the Blues, and I think I was at my house. And we were having a, and a party during the afternoon, and uh, we had the, there was a garden and the pool outside, and I was in my studio, and I decided that I saw this hummingbird outside. And I, I uh, opened the door to see if I could, just for the, I just wanted to see what would happen. <laughs> and I went to, made a gesture towards the hummingbird. And I thought it would fly away. It came straight at me. <laughs> and That's I terrifying. Ran, and <laughs> and I, ran, I ran back in the house. <laughs> and closed the sliding door and hoped that nobody saw me <laughs> running from a hummingbird. Here I am, the superhero in movies, right? <laughs> ah, a bird! <laughs> but, but that's the kind of thing I think we'd like to see. Like, you know, we love it when somebody steps outside of what they're known for and you know what was it the, the first time we saw Robert De Niro and in, in Meet the Parents or something like that and you're just like this guy's been funny the whole time this is I I'm just I planting the seed I'm just do, on behalf of the people I'm well, just I, saying I, I'm not a tough guy I never have been a tough guy I never wanted to be a tough guy I'm just a nice little boy <laughs> who uh you know who's likes beautiful ladies. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll get a t-shirt made for you that says that if you want. <laughs> I saw you on Kelly Clarkson the other day and uh, you opened the interview by serenading her. You don't have to do that now. I'm more of a Jay Hud than a Kelly Clarkson. But you have an amazing singing voice. And I think a lot of people already know that. But like so in the 70s and the 80s, we got a lot of celebrity side projects of just people putting out disco albums, putting out R&B albums, actors, uh, people who were not necessarily pop stars. What prevented us all from getting a Billy D. Williams album? A Billy D. Williams. An album. Why didn't, you, why didn't you make an album when everybody... I made an album. Did you? Wait a second. Did I not? I missed this in my research. Tell me everything about this album. No, I made an album in 1961 and uh, called Let's Misbehave with Billy D. Williams. Of course. Of course. <laughs> of course that's what it's called. Uh, um, <laughs> it was, uh, I was being, I worked with, uh, uh, 
the song, A Taste of Honey, was written for me when I did it on stage with Joan Plowright. Um, and the president of a prestige label was starting a new label. It was a jazz label uh, called Lively Arts. And uh, it was from me, Hermione Baddeley, and, and uh, Malcolm, not Malcolm, but like McDonald. He was an old movie star. Uh, anyway, he had the, uh, the president of Prestige asked me if I wanted to do an album. I said, okay. <laughs> uh, so I went and uh, started working with guys who became really good friends of mine. The guys who wrote uh, I Left My Heart in San Francisco, uh, George Corey and Douglas Cross. So they, I worked with them. And in those years, they had what they call uh, chic East Side nightclub singers. And that's what I was training to myself to be. It's in French, they, it's uh, for the male, it's called chanteur, and for the female, it's chanteuse. Uh, there was a great lady, uh, uh, Mabel Mercer. I don't know if you've ever heard of Mabel Mercer. She was one of the greats. She was one of the great chanteuse singers. In fact, Sinatra used to love her. Um, but I was training, I was being trained to do that. So we ended up doing this album. Uh, I don't, I don't know really what to say about. <laughs> I mean, it was not bad. <laughs> it was not bad. No, I, I, it's a collect. Let me put it this way: it's a collectible. <laughs> oh, what? Uh, there's a request from the audience for you to to bust out a little classic Billy D from the Ain't Misbehaving Album. It's Alpha. very clear. Our love is here to stay. Not for a year, but ever and a day. The radio and the telephone and the movies that we know may just be passing fancies and in time may go. But oh my dear, our love is here to stay. <laughs> Together we're going a long, long way. In time, the Rockies may crumble, Gibraltar may tumble. They're only made of clay, but our love is here to stay. Woo! Still got it, baby. Still got it. Now we're gonna, in just a few minutes, we're gonna turn the microphones over to the audience for a Q&A. But before we do, I wanna ask about the pros and cons of theater versus film for you. You've had such a great career in both. You started in theater, made, you've been in like a hundred movies. Is there one or the other that has a, a, a more special place in your heart? Really, it's all been a wonderful, beautiful adventure, and I'm very fortunate. I, you know, I d loved doing stuff on stage and working in front of a, a live audience. You get so much from that as an actor. Uh, but it's certainly uh, movies and television is more of a technical art, uh, and there's a tremendous amount of, uh, re uh, there are a lot of rewards as a result of th that experience. I'm a lucky man. I'm a lucky man. I, I would have to say- But that I worked hard. You shoot. This book is a testament to, to that. That is, uh, that is the truth. That is, this is a story of a, of a hardworking, grateful man. And it's it's a it's a wonderful read. Um, I I think our our folks are out in the audience with microphones. If you have any questions, good questions <laughs> for Mr. Billy D. Williams, raise your hand. Uh, we'll go ahead and start right over here. Hello, um, 
Kelly Williams. Um, I must say, out of all your movies, um, Mahogany, when you first were presented to do it, what did you think it was going to be a classic or collectible, which it is to this day? Yeah, did you feel at the time that you were making something special with Mahogany? Well, you know, I was at a... I was on the contract to uh, Billy, I mean, uh, Barry Gordy uh, for seven years. And um, uh, yeah, for me, working with Diana and uh, w working for uh, Barry, uh, knowing that he was really ch making an endeavor to create something that I thought was necessary for that time, for that period. Elevating a whole point of view. Yeah. A perspective. Yeah. Bringing something to the consciousness that we had not experienced on that level. Yeah, I thought it was really important. Thank you for that gift. Thank you for the question. Okay, here. Hello, it's not a question, it's a comment. It was uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was 1972. I had just finished high school and I went to see Ladies Sing the Blues and you held your hand out to Diana Ross and you looked up from that hat. I fell in love with Louis McKay that day, <laughs> and I'm still in love with you. <laughs> oh, you're beautiful. Thank you so much. That hat deserves a, a Hollywood star all on its own. There's a portion in the book where you talk about how your father taught you how to properly put on a hat. Yeah, well, you know, in those days, uh, I don't know if it still exists today, but back in those days, uh, you're talking about a black men who were poor, and they learned about at some this whole idea of fashion. I mean, creating their own sense of fashion. Uh, my father was one of those people. Uh, Big Bill. D. Man. He was a handsome man, my father, <laughs> and very fashionable. But uh, he, he would always, and he showed me how to put a hat on. With the, the whole finger thing with the putting the hat on. <laughs> it was really interesting. Uh, but he, uh, uh, and I even remember him wearing spats. Taking it back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Google that, young people. Yeah. I've got a question over here. Uh, yes, I do. My name is Robert. How are you doing, Billy D? Uh, the Bingo Long Traveling All-Stars and Motor Kings was probably my favorite movie yet, that you made. Did you all do any research? When I first saw the movie, I didn't realize the significance with the uh, Negro Leagues and, and everything. Did you all do any research and were you trying to lay some kind of groundwork in it? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I trained and everything, you know, because uh, I was... Uh, I was playing, uh, the character I played was patterned after uh, Satchel Paige. And uh, Satchel Paige was one of the most incredible, obviously, baseball players ever. Got another one over here. He was oh, one of the great pitchers uh, back in those days during the Negro Leagues. And then he, uh, he was allowed to play in the, in the major leagues. But he was, uh, I, he was, uh, he had gotten pretty old, but he's still, I mean, there, that part of his legend, the legend of Satchel Page is about how old he was. I mean, he was in his, I think before he left baseball, he was somewhere in his 50s, I think. Oh, yeah. But he was one of the great uh, pitchers back in those days, you know, like Josh Gibson and all those people. Um, 
the the guys that we worked with, a lot of the guys that we that was that were in the movie, were actual baseball players from the Negro leagues. So I mean, a lot of the stuff that we did with the, the ball, you know, you know, driving down the road and throwing the ball and having it ricochet back, stuff like that. It wasn't like CGI. These <laughs> <laughs> they were really doing the real stuff. I mean, you got to do you got to do a baseball movie. You did uh, obviously Brian's song. You got to play a, sh a great Chicago Bear, Gail Sayers. You're an athletic man, but th I don't. I, I I read that sports never called your name, and you, like the acting bug got you before the the sporty bug could. Uh, sports, me and sports. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> No, no, I'm an actor. <laughs> uh, no, I hey, listen. I played sports, but uh, you know, sports you have to have a competitive spirit. I don't have that. You know, you can be fairly good, pretty good, develop it, but I think people who really get into sports are competitive people. Yeah, that's not my ministry either. <laughs> thank oh, you, sir. Thank you so much. Oh, yes, over here. Hi. Hello, Billy D. <laughs> yes, sir. It's nice to meet you again. Thank you. Again? Uh, yeah, you're here at the Star Wars Celebration, which I attended. Oh, ah. oh okay. <laughs> nice to see you. So, well, we've already talked about Lando Carizium, but we didn't get a chance to talk to you in your involvement in the Batman franchise. Ooh, Harvey Dent. Well, Harvey Dent, you know, I really wanted to play uh, Two-Face. Uh, John Peters, who was the producer for the first um, Star Wars, I mean, the Batman movie, uh, wanted me to play Harvey Dent. And, uh, and when I did the uh, Star Wars movies, I had a two-picture deal, so I was able to continue with that. But I didn't have it in this situation. I just had that one-picture deal uh, with the hope or the hopes of uh, doing um, uh, uh, Two-Face. But they, uh, I think they, the, the franchise changed so that I, I was not able to do it. But I, w I had hopes of doing it. But as I always say, you, you win some, you lose some. I, I think we've had enough Joker movies. I, I think we should delve more into the Harvey Dent saga. Maybe we make no, a cameo. No. I don't know. I'm just saying. I'm just throwing things out there. <laughs> if Hollywood is listening. Our next question will be over here. Oh, where am I looking? Yes, good hello, hi. Hi, good evening. Thank you, Mr. Billy D. Williams, for spending time with us. I wanted to ask you, Thank what you was it like me. working on the Jeffersons? Oh. What was it like working on the Jeffersons? It's a deep cut. Oh, I had a lot of fun. That was fun. Uh, uh, for that moment, for that, it was one of those small moments that turned into a very happy moment for a lot of people. So no, it was, uh, and working with Mahler, you know, Mahler and I did a movie together later, years la after, uh, uh, a young friend of mine, uh, we did a movie called The Visit. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. It's a very fine movie, it's a really wonderful movie. In fact, I was nominated for an a, a Independent Spirit Award for that movie. Um, uh, Jordan Walker Perlman, a young filmmaker, made it. Uh, but she and I worked together. But she, uh, Marla, uh, one of the loveliest people I've ever met in my life. And funny, certainly a very funny woman. She still pops up in things here and there and is still just, her comic timing is impeccable. Did you get to know Sherman Helmsley? Oh, yeah, yeah. He's a, yeah. I hear he's a wild man. He was a real character. <laughs> A wonderful character. They were all wonderful people, really. You know, I was privileged to uh, work with them. Thank you for the question. Where are we going next? All right, we seem to have someone very eager over here, so. Oh. <laughs> Hold up. Okay. The microphone. Uh, um, my name is Ron. I'm from New York, and thank you for the memory of Jack and Jill. <laughs> uh, I'm curious about what you're doing with your artwork. Uh, last time we met, obviously we met. 
<laughs> I was at uh, Washington, D.C., Smithsonian mm -hmm. years ago, and I was wondering what, uh, who represents you and where are you uh, able to buy your work? 1993 was the, the portrait going into the Smithsonian, your self-portrait? Uh, well, the, the, the Smithsonian has the, uh, the self-portrait, yeah. Yeah. Um, I just recently, as I said, I think I mentioned it earlier, I was in New York at the uh, Schoenberg yeah. and saw the, the painting that I, I, I uh, uh, con uh, d d d how do you say it? The donated? Donated, yeah. yes. Uh, uh, it, uh, I was really quite pleased to see it. It was really, I, I really looked at it and I thought, my goodness, what a wonderful painter I am. <laughs> How often uh, do you get to paint these days? I, I don't paint as much as I should. I've been pretty remiss about that. I do a lot of drawing. Um, Ever thought I, about I should be doing more paintings, but I've, I, I have about three, over 300 paintings um, stored away. So, um, That's a wonderful gift. Did you ever think about compiling them all into a compendium that we yeah, can Yeah, I, you know, I, I want to do an exhibition at one point or another. Uh, but I want to do another book. Uh, this book is, uh, people like this book. It's oh, yeah. Book. Number five on the New York Times bestseller list. But the, the book I want to do is something I started 20-some-odd years ago. Uh, it's a, um, it, it's a, it, it's telling my life story th through my paintings. Mm. And talking about all of my interests through my painting, which is, it's a coffee table book. So uh, I will, can I pre-order uh, it right now? Is that, <laughs> is that possible? Who do I talk to, Amazon? Barnes and Noble, Crocs and Brentanos? <laughs> we have another question from the entree over here. Hello, hi, thank you for your question. All right, first of all, uh, this is awesome. <laughs> uh, and uh, I just wanted to say, I remember when Star Wars came out, my dad was in the army, we saw it in Germany. And the thing I loved about Star Wars, it didn't matter, anybody could see it, black, white, Hispanic, it, it was awesome. But it was incredible when Empire Strikes Back came out and you see Lando Calrissian come out and you're like, whoa, they have black people in space. <laughs> and and uh, I just wanted to know when, did you think, and I love how you think, in other words, where you're able to see everything, right? It's not like I'm this or I'm that, right? But did you think when you did that role, what kind of impact that would have uh, in the future and later on? It was amazing, by the way. And oh, I yeah. did have a Lando Calrissian Star Wars uh, action figure. Oh, yeah. Same, same. You never really know, you know what the full impact is going to be when you do something. But you start out with an idea, certainly. And uh, you're uh, driven by... A in my case, uh, you know, it's all about individualism, and uh, it's about uh, a futuristic or a future way of looking at things, uh, and the eclectic way of looking at things. Um, that's what I'm going to incorporate in what I, whatever I do creatively. So, and hope for the best. But I. I think I've been, it's been really good for me in the sense that I do, I mean, just Brian's song, for instance. I mean, to be involved in a situation where um, it really literally uh, changed people's thinking, um, gave them a, an alternative vision about things. I mean, when you run in, when, like in Georgia, I'll never forget, you, when you run into a guy who's a bigot and he has to tell you how much that thing changed his life. Uh, and I said, how wonderful, even if it was just for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> I cried at the end of that movie and went right back to Hayden. <laughs> 
you know, <laughs> even if it was just for that moment, he, at least he had that one moment when he could just take a breath <laughs> <laughs> and just live without having these feelings. So, uh, which I get a kick out of, you know, when I, when I think about it. Or, you know, um, yeah, you know, it's being one of those voices in life who is saying, I'm talking about myself, who's saying, um, you know, there, there's so much more to enjoy. And we need to allow ourselves to, en to enjoy. And I don't know. You know what you I'm trying. You know what I'm trying to I say. do know. I think we all know. That role, that movie, by the way, the best Star Wars movie there. I don't I don't think that's an unpopular opinion. But it had a lot to do with, with you and how much joy you brought to the screen. Do you know how cool your character has to be to be cooler than Han Solo? <laughs> like you brought smiles to people's faces. You brought like a new way for kids to play outside with each other. You got a new character for black kids to be like, I'm Lando. <laughs> it was, it was just, it was very special and it continues to be very special because we're still, you know, adults are still showing that movie to their kids all these years later. And, you know, every day somebody, some little kid sees Lando pop on screen for the first time and is like, I'm Lando. That's a, that's, that would be a great legacy in total for any one person to have, but as having that as just, just a slice of what you have done is whew, I, just sensational, just sensational. Thank you for it. I appreciate that, thank you so much. Thank you. We've got one right here, oh hello young man. Hello. <laughs> Um, it's an honor to meet you in person and talk to you. <laughs> um, what was, um, out of all the movies you've acted for, starred for, been in, <laughs> um, which one did you feel the least confident and confident for at the start? This kid's going to take my job. Having bright kids. I know. How old are you? Ten, Ten. two days. Oh, okay. Happy birthday. <laughs> well, there's a question. What movies did you feel most and least confident doing across your career? The least confident. I don't know. You know, least confident is part of the experience, I think. Um, every time you do a project, you know, you're not always sure. Well, you know, what, but that's good. I mean, it's, uh, if you have all of the answers before you really get started, uh, I don't know if that's such a good idea. I think it's, it's a process as you go along you keep finding new values, new things t to introduce. I think that's probably the fun of it. This is interesting, a 10-year-old kid. The last 10, year, the last 10 year old kid I dealt with like this, in this situation. Was there? The kid said to me, he goes, do you ever betray anybody? That was a really an interesting moment. <laughs> well, yeah, we won't get into that. <laughs> but you're a nice boy. <laughs> and you, you, you're asking very nice questions. <laughs> was there a role that you walked on to set first day, like, I got this, Billy D in the house, don't worry about it? Or were you just swagging from the jump, the most confident you've ever been? I don't know. I don't 
I have no idea. <laughs> well, thank you for your question. That was amazing. Thank you. We have time for one more question. So, oh, there's some waving. Okay. There's some furious there's waving. waving. Okay. Sorry, everybody. It looks like there's a little bit of a, of a council going on over here. <laughs> okay, we'll see just a second. Thank you very much. I didn't need a mic, but it's okay that I've got one now. Hi, I'm Georgie. Thank Hi. you for being with us. You have been an artist of all sorts. Um, you've got lots of experience and you seem to enjoy art immensely. I'd like to know what you think makes good art. What makes wonderful art? <laughs> and I do want to get to this this man here in the front sitting right behind my mama. <laughs> Out there. What's yeah. your question say? Say you are the epitome of a great black lady. Mm -hmm. And you made sure that you were humble, but yet you're very powerful because of your humility. Mm -hmm. well, that's very kind of you. Thank very you. Very kind. And something. Can I go? Something that I bet you hear. You're more than than never. You've you've got, you've got a, a. There's a lot of of American history, a lot of cinematic history, a lot of Black history, all in this this one chair, all in this one man. That's a that's quite a feat, sir. Yeah, look at you. I'm I'm like barely Chicago history. <laughs> so to have all of those things in one person is is something. Now, I, before we let y'all go and dig Can into this one? book. Can I do? Oh, sure. Yeah, sorry. The lights, they're so bright. Thank you. So, um, I've been a D. Williams. So, before uh, there was What Have We Here, back to the Jeffersons, can you do just do Chow Bella? <laughs> she asked you to give your delivery of Chow Bella. <laughs> you have tickled Billy D. Williams. <laughs> Ciao, Bella. That's her ringtone now. I, io penso che tu sei meravigliosa. Stop being so multi-talented. Now, before we let you go, I think we should all know that in a couple of months is Billy D. Williams' 87th birthday. That's in April. Two part question. What are you looking forward to in the next year? And how do you celebrate your birthday? Do I celebrate my birthday? Yeah. I don't. <gasps> no, no, no. In my head, you have these amazing parties. I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, at this point in my life, well, first of all, you know, uh, in my household, it's like my daughter and, uh, and my son-in-law and my grandkids. Uh, we all celebrate each, you know, whenever there's a birthday, we all sort of celebrate the birthday. Marcy, uh, uh, Marcy Fine, who runs my life, <laughs> and she, she uh, uh, we celebrate. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, if you if you want a party, we can we can throw you a party. <laughs> I don't know. I know a, I know I a don't cake baker. Really She's here lot. today. <laughs> but what are you looking forward to in year eighty seven? Are, are you looking forward to chilling? Are Listen, you looking? I'm glad I'm above the earth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, happy, happy almost birthday, Mr. Billy D. Williams. Well, thank you very much.
listen, I got a book that's like number five on the New York Times bestsellers. That's uh, amazing. List. I mean, I can't ask for anything more than that. That's brilliant. That's really, and you've worked hard. This this press tour is has been such a delight to watch from here. Thank you for making us your last stop on this tour. We appreciate you making the time uh, for for all of us. We're your fans. We've grown up with your work and with your with your charm and. Honestly, this is one of the highlights of my life, <laughs> sitting here next to you. So uh, on behalf of all of us here, thank you so, so much. I really do. Thank you so much. Shit. May the force be with you. Chandelier, <laughs> baby. Thank you, everyone. And on behalf of WBZ and Chicago Public Media, I've been Jill Hopkins. Good night. <laughs>